Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, love this town, and uh, it's a thrill to be here with uh, Jim Johnson, uh, who did so much for uh, Fannie Mae, and that was the greatest single stock in my life, and uh, it's still my largest position, and I, anybody wants to talk after about how to make money, I'll tell them how to buy more Fannie Mae, and I've added Freddie Mac to the list, too, and Congressman Ed Markey, who was a, went to Boston College and also Boston College Law School, and has done a great job in Congress for... Uh, for everybody in this country, but especially the people in his districts in Massachusetts. But great honor is to have my wife, Carolyn, right here, my, uh, my sweetheart, my uh, great stock picker who, uh, who uh, found legs and uh, a bunch of other good stocks. So what I'm going to try and do today uh, briefly is, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this gavel. I've never had one of these things before. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm going to try and uh, say some words on the things I've used over the years uh, when I was an amateur, when I ran Magellan, I still use today. I think they make sense. I think they make a lot of sense for investors. And uh, I frankly think it's a, a tragedy in America that the small investor has been convinced by the media, the print media, the, the radio, the television media, that they don't have a chance. That they don't, the big institutions with all their computers and all their degrees and all their money have all the edges. And it just isn't true at all. And when they're convinced, when this happens, when this occurs, people act accordingly. They, when they believe it, they buy stocks for a week, and they buy options, and they buy the Chile fund this week, and next week it's the Argentina fund, and, and they get results proportional to that kind of investing. And that's very bothersome. I think the public can do extremely well in the stock market on their own. I think the fact that institutions dominate the market today is a positive for small investors. These institutions push stocks on usual lows, they push them on usual highs, for someone that can sit back and have their own opinion, know something about the industry, this is a positive. <coughs> it's not a negative. So that's what I want to talk about. And the single, uh, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say the reason I own this is the sucker is going up. I mean, that's the only reason, that's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10-year-old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. And that's true, I think, about 80% of people that own stocks. And this is the kind of stock people like to own. This is the kind of company people adore owning. This is a relatively simple company. They make a, a very uh, narrow, easy to understand product. They make a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point, data IO, IO array processor with an optimizing compiler, a 16 dual port memory, a double diffused metal oxide semiconductor monolithic logic chip with a plasma matrix vacuum fluorescent display. It has a 16-bit dual memory. It has a Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicone emitter, a high bandwidth, that's very important, six gigahertz, <laughs> double metallization communication protocol, an asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleave memory, a token ring and change backplane, and it does it in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of crap like that, <laughs> you will never make money. Never. Somebody will come along with more whetstones or less whetstones or a bigger mega flop or a smaller mega flop. You won't have the foggiest idea what's happened. And people buy this junk all the time. I made money in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I can understand it. I. Uh, when there was recessions, I didn't have to worry about what was happening. I could go there, and people were still there. I didn't have to worry about low-priced Korean imports. I mean, I just didn't have, you know, I can understand it. And you laugh, I made 10 or 15 times my money in Dunkin' Donuts. Those are the kind of stocks I can understand. If you don't understand it, it doesn't work. This is the single biggest principle. And it bothers me that people are very careful with their money. The public, when they buy a refrigerator, they get a consumer reports, so they buy a microwave oven, they do that. They ask people what's the best kind of radar range or, they, or what kind of car to buy. They do research on the apartments. When they, go to, when they go on a trip to Wyoming, they get the mobile travel guide or California. When they go to Europe, they get the Michelin travel guide. People will hear a tip on a bus on some stock and they'll put half their life savings <laughs> in it before sunset and they wonder why they lose money in the stock market. And when they lose money, they blame it on the institutions and program training. That is garbage. They didn't do any research. They bought a piece of junk. They didn't look at the balance sheet. And that's what you get for it. 
And that's what we're being driven to. And it's self-fulfilling. The public does terrible investing, and they, they say they don't have a chance. It's because that's the, way they're, that's the way they're acting. I'm trying to convince people there is a method. There are reasons for stocks that go up. Uh, Coca-Cola, this is very magic. It's a very magic number. Easy to remember. Coca-Cola is earning 30 times per share what they did 32 years ago. The stock has gone up 30-fold. Bethlehem Steel is earning less than they did 30 years ago. The stock is half its price of 30 years ago. Stocks are not lottery tickets. There's a company behind every stock. If a company does well, the stock does well. It's not that complicated. People get too carried away. And first of all, they try and predict the stock market. That is a total waste of time. No one can predict the stock market. They try to predict interest rates. I mean, this is a, if anybody would predict interest rates right three times in a row, they'd be a billionaire. Considering there's not that many billionaires on the planet, it's very, you know, I took, I had logic, so I had a syllogism and uh, studied these when I was at Boston College. There can't be that many people that can predict interest rates because there'd be lots of billionaires. And no one can predict the economy. I had a lot of people in this room were around in 1981 and 82 when we had a 20% prime rate with double digit inflation, double digit uh, unemployment. I don't remember anybody telling me in 1981 about it. I didn't read, I studied all this stuff. I don't remember anybody telling me we're going to have the worst recession since the Depression. So, what I'm trying to tell you, it would be very useful to know what the stock market is going to do. It would be terrific to know that the Dow Jones average year from now would be X, that we're going to have a full scale recession, or interest rates going to be 12%. That's useful stuff. You never know it though. You just don't get to learn it. So, I've always said if you spend 14 minutes a year on economics, you've wasted 12 minutes. And I, I, I really believe that. Now, I have to be, I'd be fair, I'm talking about economics on the broad scale, predicting the downturn for next year or the upturn or M1 and M2, 3B and all these, all these M's. The, uh, I'm talking about economics to me is when you talk about scrap prices. When I own auto stocks, I want to know what's happening to used car prices. When used car prices are going up, it's a very good indicator. When I own hotel stocks, I want to know what hotel occupancy is about. When I own chemical stocks, I want to know what's happening to the price of ethylene. These are facts. If aluminum inventories go down five straight months, that's relevant. I can deal with that. Home affordability, I want to know about it. when I own uh, Fannie Mae or I own a housing stock. These are facts. You can, they're economic facts and it's economic predictions. And economic predictions are a total waste. And uh, interest rates, Alan Greenspan is a very honest guy. He would tell you that he can't predict interest rates. He could tell you what short rates are going to do in the next six months. Try and stick them on what the long-term rate will be three years from now. They'll say, I don't have any idea. So how are you, the investor, supposed to predict interest rates if the head of Federal Reserve can't do it? So I think that's, uh, but you should study history, and history is the important thing you learn from. What you learn from history is the market goes down. It goes down a lot. The math is simple. There's been 93 years a century. This is easy to do. The market's had 50 declines of 10% or more. So 50 declines in 93 years. About once every two years, the market falls 10%. We call that a correction. That means, that's a euphemism for losing a lot of money rapidly. But we, you know, we call it a correction. And uh, uh, so 50 declines in 93 years, about once every two years, the market falls 10%. Of those 50 declines, 15 have been 25% or more. That's known as a bear market. We've had 15 declines in 93 years. So every six years, the market's going to have a 25% decline. That's all you need to know. You need to know the market's going to go down sometime. If you're not ready for that, you shouldn't own stocks. And it's good when it happens. If you like a stock at 14 and it goes to 6, that's great. You understand the company, you look at the balance sheet, and they're doing fine. And you're hoping to get to 22 with it. 14 to 22 is terrific. 6 to 22 is exceptional. So you take advantage of these declines. They're going to happen. No one knows when they're going to happen. It would be very, people tell you about it after the fact that they predicted it, but they predicted it 53 times. And uh, so you can take advantage of the volatility the market if you understand what you own. Uh, so I think that's the key to element. Another key element is that you have plenty of time. People are in an unbelievable rush to buy a stock. I'll give you an example of a well-known company. Walmart went public in October of 1970. 1970 went public. Already had a great record. It had 15 years performance, great balance sheet. You could have waited 10 years saying you're a very conservative investor, you're not sure this Walmart can make it. 
You want to check, you're, you're, you see them operate in small towns, you're afraid they can only make it in seven or eight states, you want to wait till they go to more states, you keep waiting. You could have bought Walmart 10 years after it went public and made 35 times your money. If you bought it when they went public, you would have made 500 times your money, but you could have waited 10 years after Walmart went public and made uh, 30, over 30 times your money. You could have waited three years after Microsoft went public and made 10 times your money. Now, if you knew something about software, I know nothing about software. If you knew something about software, you would have said, these guys have it. I don't care who's going to win, Compaq, IBM. I don't know who's going to win Japanese computers. I know Microsoft, MS-DOS is the right thing. You could have bought Microsoft. Again, I'm repeating myself, stocks are not a lottery ticket. There's a company behind every stock. And you, you can just watch it. You have plenty of time. People are in an amazing rush to purchase a security. They're out of breath when they call up. You don't need to do this. It's, uh, the, uh, you need an edge to make money, too. People have incredible edges, and they throw them away. I'll give you a quick example of uh, Smith Klein. This is a stock in, that had Tagamet. Now, you didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was doing clinical trials. You didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was talked about in the New England Journal of Medicine or the British version, Lancet. You could have bought Smith Klein when Tagamet first came out, a year after it came out. Let's say your spouse, your mother, your father, you were a nurse, you were a druggist, you're writing all these prescriptions. Tagamet was doing an amazing job of curing ulcers, and it was a wonderful pill for the company because if you just stopped taking it, the ulcer came back. See, it wasn't, it would have been a crummy product, but you took it for a buck and it went away. But it was a great product for the company. But you could have bought it two years after the product was on the market and made five or six times your money. I mean, all the druggists, all the nurses, all the people, millions of people saw this product. And they're out buying oil companies, you know, or drilling rooms, you know. <laughs> it happens. And then three years later, or four years later, Glaxo, even a bigger company, it's a huge company, a British company, brought out Zantac, which was a better, at that time, an improved product. And you could have seen that take market share do well. You could have bought Glaxo and tripled your money. So you only need a few stocks in your lifetime. They're in your industry. I think of people, if you'd worked in the auto industry, let's say you're an auto dealer the last 10 years, you would have seen Chrysler come up in the minivan. You seen If you're a Buick dealer, or a Toyota dealer, a Honda dealer, you would have seen the Chrysler dealership packed with people. You could have made 10 times your money on Chrysler a year after the, the minivan came out. Ford introduces the Taurus Sable, the most successful line of cars in the last 20 years. Ford went up sevenfold on the Taurus Sable. So if you're a car dealer, you only need to buy a few stocks every decade. When your lifetime's over, you don't need a lot of five baggers to make a lot of money starting with $10,000 or $5,000. So in your own industry, you're going to see a lot of stocks. And that's what bothers me. There are good stocks out there looking for you, and people just aren't listening, and they're just not watching it. And uh, they have incredible edges. People have big edges over me. <clears throat> they work in the aluminum industry. I see aluminum industries coming down, in inventories coming down six straight months. They see demand improving. In America today, you know, you know, it's hard to get an EPA permit for a bowling alley, never mind an aluminum smelter. So you know when aluminum gets tight, you just can't build seven aluminum smelters. So when, when you see this coming, you can say, wait a second, I can make some money. When an industry goes from terrible to mediocre, the stock goes north. When it goes from mediocre to good, the stock goes north. When it goes from good to terrific, the stock goes north. There's lots of ways to make money in your own industry. You can be a supplier in the industry, you can be a customer. This thing, this thing happens in the paper industry, it happens in the steel industry. It doesn't happen every week, but if you're in you're some field, you'll see a turn, you'll see something in the publishing industry. These things come along, and it, it's just mind-boggling, people throw it away. Uh, one, one of the things I find a rule, I, 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 a couple of rules I want to throw out <coughs> that I find useful, <coughs> excuse me, is a lot of times people buy on the basis, the stock has gone down this much, how, you know, how much further can it go down? I remember when Polaroid went from 130 to 100, people said, here's this great company, great record. If it ever gets below 100, you know, just buy every share, you know, and it did get below 100. A lot of people bought on that basis saying, look, it's gone from 135 to 100. It's now 95, what a buy. Within a year, it was 18. And this is a company with no debt. I mean, this is a company, it was just so overpriced, it went down. Uh, I did the same thing in my, uh, I think my first or second year of Fidelity. Kaiser Industries had gone from $26 a share to 16 I said, how much lower can it go? It's 16 
So I think we bought one of the biggest blocks ever on the, New York, on the American Stock Exchange of Kaiser Industries at 14. I said, you know, it's gone from 26 to 16. How much lower can it go? Well, at 10, I called my mother and said, Mom, you're going to uh, look at this Kaiser Industries. I mean, how much lower can it go? It's gone from 26 to 10. <laughs> well, it went to 6, it went to 5, it went to 4, it went to 3. And uh, now I am fortunate this happened rapidly. I would probably be still caddying or uh, being, you know, working at the stop and shop. But I, it happened fast. So I was able to, this, this was compressed. It, uh, and at three, I figured out, you know, there's something very wrong here because Kaiser Industries owns 40% of Kaiser Steel. They own 40% of Kaiser Aluminum. They own 32% of Kaiser Cement. They own Kaiser Broadcasting. They own Kaiser Santa Gravel, Kaiser Engineers. They own Jeep. They own business after business. And they had no debt. Now, I learned this very early. This might be a breakthrough for some people. It's very hard to go bankrupt if you don't have any debt. It's, it's tricky. Some people can approach that. It's a real, it's a real achievement. But they had no debt. And the whole company at three was selling at about 75 million. At that point, it was equal to buying one Boeing 747. I said, there's something wrong with this company selling for 75 million. I was a little premature at 16, but uh, I said, everything's fine, and eventually this will work out. And they, what they did is they gave away all their shares to their shareholders. They, they passed out shares in Kaiser Cement. They passed out shares in Kaiser Aluminum. They passed out their public shares in Kaiser Steel. They sold all the other businesses, and you get about $50 a share. And but if you didn't understand the company, if you're just buying on the fact the stock had gone from 26 to 16 and then it got to 10, what would you do when it went to 9? What would you do when it went to 8? What would you do when it went to 7? This is the problem that people have, is they sell stocks because they didn't know why they bought it, then it went down, and they don't know what to do now. Do you flip a coin? Do you walk around the block? You know, <laughs> what do you do? It's psychiatrists that haven't worked so far. I've never seen them running in. The, the, the psychological psychiatry fund I've never seen listed for the... Uh, with the SEC to make it through as a mutual fund. So I, they haven't seemed to help. Uh, I've tried prayer, that hasn't worked. The, uh, the, uh, so if you don't understand the company, you have this problem when they go down. Uh, eventually they always come back. Uh, this one is, uh, this one doesn't work either. Uh, people think uh, RCA just about get back to its 1929 high when General Electric took it over. Uh, a lot of double knits never came back. Remember those beauties? Uh, <laughs> Uh, floppy disks, Western Union, uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, people saying it'll come back. Well, it doesn't have to come back. Uh, here's another one you hear all the time. It's $3. How much can I lose? I've had people call me up saying, I'm thinking of buying this stock at 3 How much can I lose? Well, again, you, you may need a piece of paper for this, but if you put, uh, if you, you put $20,000 in a stock at 50 or your neighbor put $20,000 at, at 50 into the stock, and you put $20,000 in at three, and it goes to zero, you lose exactly the same amount of money, everything. And people say, it's three, how much can I lose? Well, if you put a million dollars on it, you can lose a million dollars. Just the fact that stock, this is the only, this may be a reason to research a stock. The fact that stock is three down from 100 doesn't mean you should uh, buy it. And in fact, short sellers, people that really make money in stocks, they don't show at Walmart, they don't show at Home Depot, they don't short the great companies, Johnson Johnson. They short stocks down from 80 to 7. They'd like to short it at 16 or 22, but they, they figured out at 7 that this company is going to go to zero. They just haven't blown taps on this thing yet. It's going to zero. And they're, they're selling short at 7, they're selling it short at 6, at 5, at 4, at 3, at 2, at 1 and a quarter. And you know what? To sell something short, you need a buyer. Somebody has to buy the damn thing. And you wonder, who's buying this thing? It's these people saying it's 3. How much lower can it go? You know, the, uh, the, uh, now, here's a subject that you probably uh, all talked about. Getting close. Getting close. All right, we'll drop that one out. The, uh, the, it's getting very close, so it, uh, everybody has to go somewhere. So uh, the important thing is you can't get too attached to a stock. You have to understand there's a company behind it. You can't treat this like your grandchildren. You, know, you have to deal with the stock and say, I understand the company. And if they, it deteriorates, if the fundamentals slip, you have to say goodbye to it. You have, if one rule you want to remember is the stock does not know you own it. This is, this is a breakthrough. So don't get, you know, you have to understand it and say they're doing well and as long as they keep doing well, my best stocks have been my fifth, sixth, seventh year I own them, not my fifth, sixth, seventh day. So you have to understand that and uh, stay with it. And then uh, I'll switch through to my, uh, my long shots. Avoid long shots. I bought about 30 long shots in my life. I've never broken even on one. Uh, the ones that are really bad are what we call whisper stocks. And uh, if Arthur Levitt was here, he'd, he'd, he'd appreciate these stories. But these are the, 
Sometimes if somebody calls you up and say, hi, Peter, how's Carol and how are the kids? And I'd like to talk to you about uh, International Blivet. And, uh, and it, uh, what they have in this company is they have very good uh, earnings. Uh, earnings going to be very uh, They're going to be big, small. <laughs> three dollars, uh, one dollar share. And they keep whispering. And they say, what are you talking about? I don't understand it. And <clears throat> these are, now either they're so surrounded by people they're going to run out and buy this stock because it's so exciting, or they think the SEC is listening in. They'll get a shorter term. You know, they'll get six months in the in the camp rather than two years in the camp. For, but whisper stocks don't work. Uh, the uh, and then I want to conclude with uh, there's always something to worry about. Uh, if you own stocks, there's always something to worry about. You can't get away from it. Uh, what happens in the 50s? People were worried about. Uh, the, the only reason we got out of the depression was World War II. We got another recession in the early 50s. They said we're going to go right back into a depression. People worried about a depression in the 50s, and they were worried about nuclear war. I mean, back then, uh, you know, the, the little warheads they had then, they couldn't blow up McLean, West Virginia, or McLean, Virginia, you know, or, or Charlestown. Now, all these countries that end in Stan, there's nine of these Stan countries that have come out of Russia, they all have enough warheads to blow the world up, and no one worries about it. When I was a kid, People were building fallout shelters, and we used to have this, this civil defense drill. Remember this one in high school? I mean, you get under your desk. I never thought even then that was a particularly good thing to do. <laughs> this, you know, they blow with somebody put a hat, and we'd all get under our desk. You know, it, uh... But in the 50s, people wouldn't buy stocks, except for the 80s. The 50s was the best decade of the century of the stock market. And people wouldn't buy stocks in the 50s because they're worried about nuclear war, and they're worried about depression. Then people, <coughs> remember when oil went from 4 to 40? And it was going to go to 100, and we we're going to have a depression. Remember that one? Well, about three years later, the same experts, now higher paid, oil's now at 10, and they said it was going to go to 4, and we we're going to have a depression. And then the Japanese, remember how the Japanese were going to own the world? Remember that one? And that we're going to have a depression? And then about two years later, we we're all worried about Japan collapsing. And this is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. This is a company with a 20% savings rate, incredible workforce, incredible productivity, and people were saying we're going to have a depression because Japan's going to collapse, and they had. You know, on their prayer list, they load Mother Teresa and crippled children, and they were praying for Japan at night. You know, you know, you know it's unbelievable. I mean, it's the, the LDC debt. Remember the LDC debt? Remember that one? All these countries, all Chase had lent their net worth to Brazil, Chile, Peru, and all these other countries, and so had and all the other countries. And LDC said they were not going to pay it back, and we we're going to have a depression. It always ends, and we we're going to have a depression. Or the Great Depression. We're going to have the Great Depression. I never could quite understand that adjective in front of depression, but, the, uh, but with the Great Depression, or the big one, the big one's coming. But all these countries, and now I understand, you know, these are called the, then they were called less developed countries. Now, we used to call them underdeveloped countries. Those are all wrong terms. Those are not politically correct. You have to call these emerging countries. You can't use less developed or underdeveloped because that's, in fact, the other day I heard the politically correct term for something that's overweight is laterally challenged. That's the, uh, <laughs> the uh, that's a, in, so there's always something to worry about. And the key organ in your body in the stock market is your stomach. It's not the brain. If you can add 8 and 8 and get reasonably close to 16, that's the only level of math you need to know. You don't know to need the area under the curve. Remember that quadratic equation and a, an integral calculus and the area under the curve? I mean, whoever cared what was under the damn curve? I mean, you know, <laughs> but you had to study this. You don't need this in the stock market. So all you have to know is you're going to see it's always going to be scary. There's going to be always something to worry about. And you just have to forget all about it. Cut it all out and own good companies, our own turnarounds, study them and you'll do well. And that's all there is and I've, I'm ready for questions. Okay, thank you very much.